So up next, we have Hernan and Iris talking to us about purple blobs. Hernan is a geophysicist and professional geoscientist with an interest in integrating geology into geophysical interpretations. He joined Patterson, Grant, and Watson in 1997, where he has been processing, interpreting, and modeling geophysical data with a strong emphasis on, on obtaining geological information from the various geophysical data. Uh, Iris is a structural geologist and a professional geoscientist with an interest in the role of structure in the formation of ore deposits. She completed her BSc in geochemistry, her MSc in structural geology, and her PhD at McMaster University focusing on the deformation of the south range of the Sudbury impact structure. In 2012, Iris joined SRK in Toronto where she worked on regional uh, structural interpretations as well as lithological and structural modeling. In April 2015, she joined PGW, where she brings her experience in uh, structural field mapping, fault analysis, and integration into the geology and geophysics of 3D modeling and geophysical modeling. Good afternoon, and thank you to TGDG for inviting us to this talk, and it's in found a very interesting symposium topic and in a very timely manner. Uh, we're going to talk about geophysics today, and the very technical title of Purple Blobs uh, is meant to emphasize that we're getting away from the direct targeting. You have your geophysical data sets, you've drilled your conductor, and now what? What else can we get out of this data set? Um, so Hernan's going to show some advanced modeling techniques, and I'm going to show the influence of a, that the geological model can have on the geophysical processing as well. So the motivation for this talk is that um, we, are, we need to use geophysics in any geological mo model. There's so many situations when there is a, a lack of outcrop, there's a sedimentary overburden, there's vegetation cover, and, and the geometry of the lithology of the is a change in depth. So we need to have this 3D understanding. Uh, in these situations, uh, geophysics is brought in as a tool to map at depth and below the cover but mostly the geophysical data is underutilized or not the optimal method is used. So often the, um, the, the geophysical data is used for the direct targeting, but um, the understanding the lithological controls from the geophysics is not being used. So we want to show some new advances on geophysical data processing and integration and how to obtain geological information from the geophysical data and use this to narrow the search for mineral deposits. Uh, we're going to show some case studies from the Bathurst mining camp uh, and uh, show which uh, techniques we can use for, for improving the methodology. Uh, this is part of the motivation as well as an example of an, a magnetic data set and um, with an old style interpretation. Sure, there's a uh, it's been subdivided into the red lines and the black lines, and even the red lines are offsetting the, the black ones. But I think there's a bit more we can get out of a data set like this. Uh, what are the lithologies? Are there any domains? What is the understanding of the, those lineaments that have been, have been mapped? How do they interact? What is the tectonic history behind them? Um, so from a, for our examples, we're going to show from, from Bathurst uh, which is one of Canada's oldest mining districts of DMS deposits. There's uh, at least 25 massive sulfide deposits with resources over 1 million tons. And about 70% of these were discovered in the 1950s with a combination of <coughs> geology and geophysics. Um, it's one of the best camps to play with the geophysics since it's been flown extensively uh, with a wide variety of data sets. Um, have to bring a bit of a geology map in. It's a, quite a complex situation. There's uh, multiple deformation events. It's a series of felsic and mafic intrusives, sedimentary rocks, granite intrusives. Um, the formation <coughs> is, is uh, Paleozoic, uh, initial rift sediments, uh, Initial rift sediments then crustal extensions which formed felsic volcanic rocks, uh, continued uh, crustal expansion formed mafic volcanic sediments. So these felsic and the mafic volcanics are interlayered. And uh, the 
con continuing sub subduction caused off these sediments, had some thrusting and backup extension formed some later, later granites. Then there's uh, five recognized deformation events. Uh, D1 with inclined recumbent folds with uh, strong <coughs> planar foliation. D2, uh, isoclinal folds. D3, another or fold orientation. And D4 and 5, which produces these kilometer scales, anti and synclines that are seen on the map scale. So overall, it's quite a complex uh, setting. And to understand the distribution of each of the units, uh, we really need, uh, need to understand how they are folded and refolded to find out how they're connected. Um, especially as the deposits in the Bathurst mining camp are, uh, re <coughs> are related to specific horizons within the felsic volcanic rocks. They've been slightly remobilized, but most of the uh, deposits are within the, the um, um, later middle Ordovician in the felsic volcanic rocks. So they're in the submarine alkaline units that form during the backup rifting. There is also associated with feeder zones and the deposits have been transposed. So why did we choose Bathurst as an example? It's, there's uh, the XTEC program, which from the mid to the late 90s, um, which uh, funded a um, mag aeromagnetic spectrometry, fluid domain EM, and a strong lithogeochemical study. So there's a vast set of information. Uh, that uh, project itself did not fully solve the geology of the camp. So even though there's a good understanding of the near surface distribution of the rocks, the, the depth distribution is not well known. Uh, the XTEC program identified some mineralized horizons, but on, found only one non-economic deposits. So there's a potential for multiple new deposits at depth that are linked to the stratigraphic units, but we don't know where they are. That's when TGI3 came in. <laughs> and I came in. <laughs> yes. Ooh, that was rough. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, so the GSC brought the TGI3, and I, I wanted to talk about this because this is where, uh, when I was doing a postdoc with Bill Morris, my master, that was pretty much what I was working on. Uh, they, collect, they kept collecting data the main focus was on gravity data because we are thinking, okay, this is massive sulfides, these things are dense, so if they're dense, gravity should work. So they did, an, they put an immense effort, they collected three and a half thousand ground gravity stations uh, over such a broad mining camp. That's quite a lot of data. The end, you end up with a spacing of roughly one kilometer. That's the Bugier gravity map published by the GSC, and of course, yeah, you see the the main folded sequence there. You see it pretty well. And anybody, the main thing is that yeah, if you look at, for example, things like the one BD of the Bugier gravity, the people at the GSC start looking at this. And, hmm, we're getting excited because all the white dots here are deposits, and they start looking at anomalies in this in, on this map that they think they thought it could be related to a deposit. So when we look at it, yeah, maybe there is something there, but it's also the fact that you're looking at data that has been collected with irregular spacing. So you have uh, stations kind of all over the place, depending on what access do you have. And most of the time, irregular sampling can produce single point anomalies. So you have to be very careful what you're doing with that. After that, we have, well, we have access to airborne gravity data, um, gravity gradiometry data, so on. I'm not going to mention that. But before we get into can we use this data or not, I would like to show you, well, what can, what can, what do we see on it from a modeling perspective. So I'm going to get some examples from Mike Thomas from the GSC. He did this great example, which is a pretty much a sulfide sheet with a very generous density contrast because you're talking that you have 
pretty much play, uh, plain sulfides with density of four uh, grams per cc against a host rock of, uh, with a density of 2.8. So you have 1.2 grams per cubic, cubic centimeter of density contrast. That's quite a lot. And depending on the geometry of that is what anomaly you get. So if you, it's horizontal, you get a very broad anomaly. If it's vertical, it's a peak. And if it's dipping, you get a different anomaly. But overburden can com really complicate things because this example was all these models were at surface. If you put this under a sedimentary cover, the amplitude of your anomaly is going to be much, much smaller. So for example, you take this sulfide body with the same density contrast and you bring it down under a sedimentary sequence. So if you get it at, if you go, to, for example, to a 200 meters depth, you get a 20% of the amplitude of the anomaly you would get at surface. Just 200 meters of overburden pretty much are going to kill your signal. And I want you to point here, well, this thing is coming here. Even if you have this very dense body at surface, you get an anomaly of 1.2 milligal. The question is, is that large enough? Can we see this thing? Because, yeah, of course, well, as soon as you put a verb burden, the, your, your amplitude, oh, it's my nose. The amplitude is going to be way smaller than that. So that was our gravity. I wanted to look as well at magnetics. What can we do with magnetics in terms of this thing? Okay, well, we want to find this deposit somehow. So I'm going to have a quick look at Caribou, which is on the northern part of the camp. Uh, there is an arrow there because I can't find my mouse. And so we also did some gravity traverses when I was at Mac with Bill. Uh, so we did some traverses around here, pretty much trying to cross cut. Well, all these, the, the green units are mostly mafic volcanics, the brown and or orange are some felsics. So, and you can tell this thing is insanely folded and refolded, so it's quite complicated. But it, and the message is that, yeah, we collected more data, ground data, detailed data, and I don't see a thing there. That's my Bouguer, uh, compiled Bouguer map after I compiled extra uh, additional data, and I don't see a deposit there. So, well, let's, leave, let's see, well, why don't we see it, or what can we see about it? So we took a mo uh, the actual conceptual model by, by Wayne with Fellow. So, so this is a section, and we're going to see a section over there that's and you see it's mostly a subvertical uh, sulfide deposit. So if I take that and I try to model it on 3D, what I do here is I, I, I have my magnetic data and on top I have the outline of pretty much the geology bodies. In this case, it's still, it can be reasonably simply, simply, uh, simple to model because everything is dipping more or less subvertical. So I can assume that, okay, I take my contacts on surface and extend those things down. So I digitize that and I put my massive sulfide lens there. It's, you can barely, you can see it because it's just 10 meters wide based on the geological section we had from Wayne. And we do that in 3D, so it's, yeah, so you get the mag. And if you look at cross-section, the thing, the, the main uh, consequence of this is that the signal is being driven by the mafic volcanics. My massive sulfide, pretty much I can remove it, and it's not going to affect the model. So summary of this, the gravity signal, it does, doesn't seem to be that large for us to actually see the deposit. And for the magnetics, we are getting the signal just from the matrix. We can just see a deposit just by looking at it. So we need to do something else. So, do I stick? Okay. So we're going to look at two areas in detail and we're trying to, okay, let's put all our tools together and let's see what we, we can do with this. And this is pretty much what we, the message, message we want to convey here is that, okay, we have lots of data we don't have that much money to acquire new data, but okay, let's try to see what can we do with it. So we, <clears throat> we picked two areas, in the, um, one in the northwest and one in the southeastern corner of the, of the mining camp. The, the first area in the northwest is, um, seems to be made up mostly of a uniform 
uh, felsic volcanic rhyolites, felsic tuffs, quartz, um, quartz and felsparphyric tuffs, and, um, and some granite in intrusions. The, the second area seems quite uniform as well. It's mostly sand and siltstone with some um, granite intrusives, and there's a few known lead zinc, zinc deposits in each of the areas. Uh, so we took a look at the, um, the mag and the apparent conductivity, and we realized that there are some discrepancies between the, the map geology, uh, the, the regional geological map, and the RTP and the uh, apparent conductivity, which is understandable because the regional geology map maps is made from the surface map and there's less than 1% outcrop. So there's way more information still in the geophysics. For the first area, this is a comparison of the geological map with the RTP mag. And some of the units show, show up quite well. There's a, a shale here in the north northeastern corner where the, the two deposits are that uh, has a strong uh, strong signal. Then the granites in the in the south they show as as low units. This fold structure in the northeastern corner shows up well. But then in the central area where there's an additional four deposits, there seems to be way more heterogeneity than what the geological map seems to suggest. So there is um, uh, what looks like a dike going across the center and some probably more, more mafic or more um, susceptible units in the center. Uh, the apparent conductivity also shows that there is some heterogeneity, especially around the, the granites in the south and uh, that there is an additional layer here in the, in the northeast corner. Uh, the, from the topography and the, the radiometrics, the, the resolution is, is not that good. The, the radiometrics shows mostly what we see in the topography, that there's a, a river here on the side. We can see the granites in, in the south, but we cannot refine this central unit of the felsic volcanics. So using mostly the um, aeromagnetic and the conductivity data, we simplified and, and remapped this area based on um, which units we can differentiate in the geophysical data. So we subdivided this into uh, this complex sequence of different nappies and different uh, depositional events into broad shales, sandstones, um, rhyolites, granites, and, and mafic volcanics, and added some structural information where there could be fold, fold axes and potential faults. Uh, we correlated this reinterpreted area with the few, there's four or four drill holes in this area. They show that this central part is actually a interlayering of felsic volcanics and more uh, felsic tufts and rhyolites. Which, um, which is what we, we saw in, in the mag as well, that there's a, a, <coughs> a heterogeneity between the, the felsic volcanic rocks. And the dike that we interpreted in the center is also present in some of these drill holes as Gabber and Guy Ray's dike. And then we started geophysical model. It was the geological thing, you know? Oh. So we went to model this thing now. Uh, so, how are we going to do it? I, someone was asking me before, well, what do you use for modeling? Well, lately I've been focusing mostly on geological models that I can build using as much geology as I can, but also fit some information from the geophysics. So, we start by building a, the first st step is to build a representative 3D structural model. Okay. Thanks. Uh, structural model that obeys mostly basic principles and it's um, compatible, compatible with the evidence provided by the geophysical maps. And then we, we're going to test that by doing some extra geophysical model. So we start with, well, we said we were to talk about the structure. Well, in this case, 
we have only two thrusts, one here and one here, that we model. Uh, we put all these lines here, but we didn't, they were not that clear on the geophysical map, and actually putting extra faults here wasn't really going to help much. So for the structural part, we just use those two thrusts. The idea is that once you put faults on this, you generate a fault network, or you're, you divide your map into a faulted area, so you, you define kind of compartments on your map. And then you need to populate every compartment with some lithological points. So in this case, for example, I'm dividing my area, my map in one, two, three areas. So if I want to solve lithology over the whole map, I need to populate those three areas with some lithological points. So that is not easy to do just based on surface mapping, because on the surface I only have the, what it was, whatever was outcropping was just the felsic volcanics or something like that. So I need to put extra constraints. So I start draw, uh, drawing some sections. So in this case, I have three sections, one northwest, one north south, and one northeast. And we interpreted something, well, this is uh, some contact we interpret from the previously, yeah, so the pretty much the shells. And I put some contacts also from surface. These are the contacts of the intrusives. So this is one of the sections. This is the first the section is the northwest one. So it's going from northwest to southeast. I'm able to model the felsic volcanics. I put the shells there, but I don't think this is right I, because I just put it like a pot like that. Uh, I don't really buy it, but trying to model this, it would require more uh, I need more information. I need to know, well, are these things going vertical? I don't have any strike and deep information. Here, I, we have the thrust and we have the shells. And this would that appears on gray here is whatever is under my bottom unit, which is sandstone. So it would be whatever is under the sandstones. And I have a very awkward wedge here that my structural geologist wouldn't approve, but I'm going to pass quick so that she doesn't get too angry. Then we have the north-south section. I have the same issue here, so I stay quiet about that, but I can see the granites, uh, the sandstone, and the shell, which is this part here. The geometry of this, so far it comes from my assumption that things are more or less deep in reasonably vertical here. Uh, another thing you can do here is you can model in 2D uh, the geophysical data and trying to infer some deep information here. For that to be, to work, you need to have good petrophysical control. We're going to talk about that soon. And then the northeast, southwest section, similar thing, reasonably vertical contacts on this side, and then some shells, and there are some mafix there, there. The other thing, the may, I have to lump the, the felsix and the mafix in one package because since they are so interbedded, it's really hard to di discriminate when do you, where do you put each package, because in some areas you have a crop in the mafix and then you have the felsic, but which one is go, which one goes on top? Because this modeling I'm doing is stratigraphical. So whatever I do, well, if, I, if, I, if in this corner I have the mafix on top, but then they come at the bottom of the earth area, it becomes a, a bit complicated. So sometimes you need to simplify things. So, we know from the, pre from the previous analysis that we won't be able to actually see something directly. So we need to think about, well, can, what can we see? The link between geology and geophysics is petrophysical data. So we have some data that Peter Schirhat, which was uh, the last student of Bill Morris, he collected some data. Uh, he went to a camp and he looked lots of petrophysical data. Uh, I'm just going to show here. I'm very interested in these histograms because, this, for example, some of the units are not just normal or they are just no monomodal. This is what you have a bimodal distribution. And most of the, hand, the time you have some tails. And you have to look at this. Well, you can see the numbers, nor can I. But the, histo the histograms are very broad. What does this, what that, uh, is it this going to tell me? That pretty much, for example, this one, if I have a density of 2.8 here, this can go as far as 2.1 maybe. So this unit can go from 2.1 to 2.9. So that's the kind of resolution I have to deal with. 
this is another view of the same thing. So you can see the actual range. For example, the rhyolites can go, well, there are samples with, I don't know what is that, but it's, uh, well, let's consider that from two to 3.4 and so on. For magnetic susceptibility, similar thing, very, very broad ranges. The other thing is that if you look at this in this histogram, there is quite a bit of overlap between units. So if I have an overlap between units, that means that whatever I try to do with the geophysics, I'm not going to be able to discriminate much because the histograms of uh, physical properties are overlapping. So in consequence of this is the two and a half D modeling, which I wanted to do to discriminate deep uh, of different units might not be sufficient. So we're going to run a 3D stochastic inversion. Pretty, pretty much what I do is that I take the 3D model I constructed before and I run, I compute first a forward model with that and then I run inversions of the data um, multiple times and then the software is going to give me the, more, the most likely geological model that comes out of that based on comparing, well, comparing, all, of course, that the, the, you're minimizing the misfit, but also that satisfies your geology and your borehouse in this case. So the results of that also is giving you three boxes, one for lithology, one for susceptibility, and one for density. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that when I'm defining the physical properties of my units, I don't say, no, this is a granite with a density of 2.7. You define it with a statistical distribution. For example, here I'm showing you the one for the Felsix and Mafix which will be a log normal with a mean of 2.8 and a standard deviation 0.15, which we try to simulate what we had with the measured data. So similarly for the other one. And the results, the other thing is that for this case, we had a gravity gradiometry data. So for the gravity, I have six components of data. So I'm inverting those six components of data plus the mag. What I'm showing here is one of the components of the gravity. This is the measure, this is the computed, and that's the misfit doesn't look really good, I agree with you. Same with the map. But then we can produce that voxel of lithology. So we have that voxel of lithology and I have the, those are the sections, it looks quite pixely because in order to compute this thing, you need to decrease the resolution, otherwise you, I will still be computing here. Uh, I can produce also a voxel of subtility. Yeah, that's the color scheme there. I clear all the susceptibilities that were less than zero, so that's why you see whites there. And I wanted to compare with previous work I had done before. I have been working on Bathor since whew, 2007 or something like that, and I, we did some two and a half D modeling with case and style from the GSC. So I have those sections there, and we loaded our voxel there, and this, this resolution seems pretty good. At least I'm able to map the intrusives pretty well. We need to discuss a bit more about the felsix and the mafix. Are you going to show that quick? And then we'll grab it. Yeah, so this is just a uh, quick showcase of another area where understanding the, the fault geometry uh, will help in uh, extrapolating the units. Um, as, as you can see from the, from the mag compared to the regional geology map, there's an additional uh, fault in that hasn't been, been mapped yet, and it appears in the conductivity as well. Uh, there's, yeah, that's no topography. So we re reinterpreted that area. Uh, there's an additional more conductive unit that's more of a shale in the middle, and the most prominent that there's a, a, a large fold, fold hinge in that central area, which we used to construct a 3D model of that fold. So conclusions, this is a, was a very weak exercise. Uh, so yes, it is possible to do more with the data that you have archived there. Uh, we, you need geological information. We need petrophysics because otherwise we're back to what I usually say, is how much would you like it to be? If you want to make deep, I can make it deep. If you want to make it shallow, I can do whatever you want if you don't give me petrophysical information. Uh, we're not doing direct targeting, we are mapping geology with this. Uh, in terms of inter reinterpreting geophysics, we need to do a better job as well. This I borrowed from Peter Bits from Monash, uh, which I met, uh, I met him at ASCG in Australia, and this is the kind of stuff he's doing with structural interpretation of magnetics. 
Petrophysics, I can't mention that enough. It's not complicated to do. You can send a student uh, to collect some data. Equipment is not expensive. And we need that. We need to refine those histograms. In this case, I was more or less eyeballing the thing, but there is still lots of room for improvement. Um, that, would, uh, that would be it. I would just would like to acknowledge the GSC for all the support. Of course, Bill, who hopefully he's going to behave and not going, he's not going to ask me anything. And Peter Schircher, who uh, collected all the petrophysical data, intrepid for the software, and PGW as well. Thanks. You, you have both been complimented on the relay approach and the tag team. They said it, it went very nicely online. Oh, thanks. Uh, have you own, overlain the geology with gravity data to see if there's correlations with the volcanic rock and the hosting? Yeah, EMS? not at the detail scale. No, not on these detailed maps. But if you show the very first map of the camp. Uh, map to be, hmm, sorry, let me keep going back. Yeah, well, this kind of map already shows, you see mostly the, the mafic units, this one. That's the main, that's the map of, that's the booger. In order to do more, 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 ge more geology, you need to use, for example, a residual map, but still it's, you see just the broad features. For example, in this case, you see this is mostly a felsic package and these are the mafix key coming here. So you see where I, I should have that geology map. Sorry, that one there. So you see the big gravity high is on this area where you have the nine miles in form and then you have the Theta Gouge antiform there which is mostly falsex. It shows as a, as a low, that thing. Thank you. And we have a comment um, here rather than a question saying that sometimes geophysics does not match geology doesn't mean that the acquired and processed geophysical data is wrong. It doesn't mean either that the mapped and interpreted geology is wrong, rather that the surface geological mapping occurs in 2D, while the geophysical mapping is always 3D, perhaps with the exception of radiometrics, although the data acquisition is 2D. Modeling using geology and geophysics needs more expert knowledge of field and structure. Yeah, well, I totally agree with that. And also, you need to consider, consider, keep in mind what are you measuring. Because, if, for example, for the radiometrics map, the radiometrics is going to give you surface information. In this case, it's mostly vegetation. You need to think about that. For the magnetics, you're going to produce a map that is going to give you information of depth. And that's not necessarily going to match your geology on surface. And also, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation <laughs> of, <laughs> of what a geologist maps as a single rock type or unit between what is, uh, has certain specific physical characteristics in terms of its density and susceptibility. So those two cannot be reconciled one on one. You have to either simplify your geology on what can, you can relate to in the geophysics. Uh, and are you prepared to speculate on the paper that we had at the TPBG earlier on the importance of shallow seismics? Uh, that shallow seismics can make a major difference to interpretation. I realize you don't have the data for that here, but you think it would help? Well, what would you consider shallow for this case? Is it like a chirp source or if you want to go within, there? Within a kilometer of surface. Uh, hmm. That's tricky, yeah, because you are talking about, well, it's related to, to density, of course, but it's, it's also related to, yeah, mostly velocity, which is not one-to-one -one all the time. The main issue with seismics there is that you're dealing with hard rock seismic. Is un un unlike the oil and gas case, which everything is nicely stratified, here is everything is tilted. And I have seen cases that when you have, for example, if you have vertical dikes, you get horizontal reflections, which is an artifact of, of the data. So trying to interpret that, I will be careful with it. Thank you.